Chapter 13, in which Eleonora discovers an unexpected use for soap and water, and Cimmerine has difficulty with a dragon. Antarel looked past Cimmerine and Eleonora as if they were not there and spoke directly to the stone prince. I told someone, father, someone was listening. He won't be happy when he founds out I was right, but I'll feel better when I tell him I've taken care of things. He might even let me have the first look into the king's crystal once Rorag gives it to us. So that's what you're after, Cimmerine said. Antarel favored her with a superior smile. Quite right, Princess Cimmerine. The king's crystal will show us the whereabouts of every piece of useful and interesting magic in the world. All we have to do is go out and pick them up. Somehow I don't think it will be that easy, Cimmerine murmured. We knew King Tokaz would never give it to us. But Warag will, as soon as he's king of the dragons. He'll have to, or we'll tell everyone how we were the ones who made sure he was the new king. Of course, we can't afford to have anyone around who might make awkward revelations. I doubt that dragons will listen to a couple of hysterical princesses, but he, Antrell pointed at the stone prince, will have to go. What are you going to do? Eleonora demanded. She was plainly frightened, and Cimmerine could see that her knuckles were white with the force of her grip on the handle of the scrub bucket. Oh, gravel seems appropriate, don't you think? Antarel said. No one will notice a few more rocks around here. Ought I to be taking this person seriously? The stone prince said in a rather doubtful tone. You'd better, if you don't want to end up in a bunch of little pebbles, Eleonora answered. She still sounded frightened, but she seemed to be getting a grip on herself. He's a wizard. You wouldn't be talking about gravel if you were the one who had to sweep the floor, Cimmerine said to Antarel. She stepped forward as she spoke, hoping to get in between Antarel and the stone prince before Antarel noticed what she was doing. She didn't think Antarel was a good enough wizard to do any real harm, but there was no point in taking chances. Stay where you are, Princess Cimmerine, Antarel commanded. I'll deal with you in a moment. Must you be so theatrical? Theatrical? You think I'm being theatrical? Antarel said furiously. I am simply showing a proper respect for the importance of this moment. You're showing off. Cimmerine said flatly, and you're not doing it very well. He doesn't sound much like a wizard to me, the stone prince said. Is he always like this? Enough! Antarel cried and raised his staff. Light shimmered along its length and began to gather at the lower end. Grinning wolfishly, the wizard tilted the staff, aiming it at the towards the stone prince. Stop that, Eleonora said. Antarel ignored her. I said stop it! Eleonora shouted, and she threw her bucket at Antarel's head. Eleonora's aim was off. The bucket hit Antarel's shoulder. A bolt of fire shot from the end of his staff and whizzed between Cimmerine and the stone prince to strike the far wall with a whooping noise and a shower of sparks. Antarel staggered, slipped in the cascade of soapy water, and fell over the bucket, dropping his staff in the process. Cimmerine darted in and kicked Antarel's staff out of his reach. He stared up at her from a mound of soggy silk and soap studs. You can't do this to me, he shrieked. Something in his voice made Cimmerine and her friend look at him more closely. Eleonora's eyes went wide and Cimmerine blinked in surprise. He's, he's collapsing, Eleonora said in a stunned voice. He's melting. Cimmerine corrected her. I can't be melting, Antarel cried. I'm a wizard. It's not true. His head disappeared into a small brown puddle, and his cries stopped. There was a moment of astonished silence. I thought it was witches who melt when you dump water over them, the stone prince said at last. It is, usually, Cimmerine said. What on earth did you put in that bucket, Eleonora? Just Water and soap and a little lemon juice to make it smell nice, Eleonora said. Hmm, huh. 
said Simmerine, thinking hard. I'll bet there's a simpler way of melting wizards, but we don't have any time right now to figure out what it is. How many buckets can you get a hold of in a hurry? Buckets? Eleonora said. Two, counting this one. And I suppose I could borrow one from Halana. That's three. And I've got two in the kitchen, and I expect the iron kettle is big enough. That's six altogether, two for each of us. You will help, won't you? Simmerine added, turning to the stone prince. Of course, the pr prince assured her. Help with what? Stopping those wizards, Simmerine said. We can't let them make Warag the next king of dragons by trickery. I don't think how, I don't see how we can stop them. Eleanor said. We can't possibly get to the Ford of Whispering Snakes before the trials start, and even if we could, we don't know where the wizards will be hiding. Well, if we tell the dragons that Warog's trying to cheat, they'll stop the trials, Simmering said, with more confidence than she felt. That will give us time to find the wizards, and I've got a way to get us to the Ford. You start collecting buckets, and I'll meet you at your place after I get the things I'll need from Kazool's. What about... And Leonora gestured with distaste at the wet, messy lump of robes in the center of the puddle that was all that remi remained of Antarel. We'll clean it up when we get back, Simmerine said. This is more important. And Leonora nodded, and the three left the banquet room. The stone prince decided to accompany Eleonora, since he was not a fast walker, and Simmerine had farther to go. Simmerine left them when they reached the main tunnel and ran back to Kazool's cave. There she went straight to her room and opened the drawer where she kept odds and ends. In the back left-hand corner, carefully wrapped in a handkerchief, were the three black feathers she had taken from beneath the left wing of the bird she had killed in the enchanted forest. She shoved the whole packet into her pocket without bothering to unwrap it and went on to the kitchen to collect her buckets. Then she hurried through the tunnels to Warag's cave, where Eleonora and the Stone Prince were waiting. When Simmerine arrived, she found the Stone Prince pumping water to fill Eleonora's third bucket, while Eleonora mixed soap and lemon juice into the second. Simmerine set her pots and pails next to the pump and went to help Eleonora. Now what? Eleonora said, when all the buckets were full of cleaning mixture. Simmerine reached into her pocket and dug out the package. Gently, she unfolded the handkerchief and removed one of the feathers, noticing, as she did, that the package also contained the pebble she had picked up in the caves of fire and night. If we each take two buckets, can we still link elbows without spilling too much? she asked. Eleonora and the stone prince looked at each other and shrugged, picking up two buckets each. Simmerine took the last bucket and the iron pot, holding the handle of the pot with only three fingers that it, so that she could keep a grip on the feather with her thumb and forefinger. A series of awkward maneuvers followed as Eleonora and the Stone Prince tried to link elbows with Simmerine without losing their balance or dropping one of their buckets. In the process, Simmerine's skirt got soaked. It's a good thing I'm not a wizard, Simmerine said. Ready? Here we go. She twisted her hand towards the edge of the iron pot and let go of the black feather. I wish we were at the ford of whispering snakes, she said as the feather fell, and the room dissolved around them. They materialized at the very edge of a river, on a flat, narrow rock that jutted out over the water, and Eleonora immediately slipped on the wet stone. If the prince had not been so solid and heavy, all three of them would have fallen into the river. As it was, it took Simmerine and Eleonora several seconds to regain their balance. When she was finally sure of her footing, Simmerine breathed a sigh of relief and quickly looked about her. The ford of whispering snakes was crowded. Dragons of all sizes and shades of green le lined the banks of the river and filled the spaces beneath the towering trees of the enchanted forest. On the far bank, a pale dragon was poring over a parchment list that Simmerine thought she remembered seeing during one of the many errands she had run the previous night. All of the dragons seemed to be talking at once, and none of them noticed Simmerine and her friends. Hello, dragons! Simmerine shouted, trying to make herself heard above the noise. Here now, what's all this? An olive green dragon on the bank turned, demanding. Someone's trying to sneak a look at the trials! Sneaks, 
hissed a soft but nonetheless clearly audible voice from somewhere near Simmerine's feet. Simmerine jumped and looked down, but though she craned her neck to see all around her, she could not find the second speaker. Get rid of them before Torum comes back with the Colin Stone, another dragon advised. We aren't trying to sneak in, and we don't care about watching the trials, said Simmerine, wishing she dared look around for Kazool. We came to warn you about the wizards. Wizards, the soft voice echoed. Wizards? The olive green dragon said skeptically, there aren't any wizards here. No, but they figured out some way of interfering with your choice of the next king, Simmerine said. They're hiding somewhere. You have to put off the trials with the Colin Stone until we can find them and stop them. If you'll just tell Kazool we're here. Put off the trials, the olive green dragon interrupted. Impossible. They've been underway for half an hour. We can't just stop in the middle. Who are all of you people anyway? A flicker of motion caught Simmerine's eye, and she looked down just in time to see a thin red snake dart from one clump of weeds to the next. Snakes, whispered the soft voice an instant later. Sneaks and wizards. I wasn't asking you, the dragon said, severely in the general direction of the snake. And whatever they are, they certainly aren't wizards. They look like somebody's princesses to me, the blue-green dragon said. Pity that. It would be so much simpler to eat them and get them out of the way. Are you sure? The third dragon said. This one at the end doesn't look like a princess. I'm beginning to think this wasn't such a good idea, the stone prince said. He may look like a prin not look like a princess, but he doesn't look edible either the blue dragon pointed out. And those two are definitely princesses. You can't go eating them out of hand. Princesses, hissed the voice from under the rock. Oh, princesses, the olive green dragon said. No wonder they're so full of wild tales. It's true, Simmerine said desperately. If you don't believe us, take us to Kazool. She will. I can't do that. The olive green dragon said, shocked. Kazool's third in line now. After Marzarin and Warag, you can't talk to people who are that close to making their attempt with a stone. It would distract them. Warag, Leonora said. Warag's next in line. Yeah, he should be starting off any minute now, said the olive green dragon. Then comes Marzarin and then Kazool. I don't expect it will take long, though. Nobody's carried the stone for more than a mile or two yet. But I'm Kazool's princess, Simmerine said. I don't care who you are, the dragon replied crossly. You can't talk to Kazool until she's done with her turn. That will be too late, Simmerine cried. You don't understand. Warag and the wizards, I've had enough of your wizards, the olive green dragon said. You're a confounded nuisance and you ought not to be pushing your way in here when you're not wanted. Go away. Simmerine, what are we going to do? Leonora said, as the olive green, green dragon turned and stalked determinedly away. At Hero School, we were always taught that if you couldn't persuade anyone to help you with something, it meant you were supposed to do it yourself, the stone prince said diffidently. And we are prepared. He lifted one of his buckets slightly. But we don't know where the wizards are, Leonora said. We have to find them before we stop them, before we can stop them, and there isn't time. Stop the wizards, whispered the soft voice. That's the first sensible thing you've said since we got here, Simmerine said to the hissing whisper. Can't you just wish to be where the wizards are? The stone prince asked Simmerine. No, you have to know where you're going or the spell doesn't work. For a moment, all three were glumly silent. Simmerine stared at the water, remembering how and where she had gotten the feathers. Suddenly, she raised her head. We may not know where the wizards are, but I bet I know someone who can find out. Hold this for a minute. Simmerine handed the, her buckets to Eleonora, then dug out the packet of feathers. She pulled the second packet feather from the packet and grabbed Eleonora's elbow. Hold on tight, everybody. I wish I were at Morwen's house, Simmerine said, and dropped the feather. The scenery shifted abruptly, and there they were standing on Morwen's porch. The house was just as tidy looking as Simmerine remembered, and the porch flood gleamed as if it porch floor gleamed as if it had just been washed. 
A black and white cat, startled by their sudden appearance, fell off the porch railing. Four others left off washing themselves to stare at Cimmerine with unwinking green and yellow eyes. I need to talk to Morwen, Cimmerine said to the cats. It's an emergency. A lean tiger-striped cat rose and oozed through a crack in the door. Cimmerine unwound herself from Eleanor, and the stone prince in her set a bucket on the porch floor. I hope this works, she muttered to herself, as Eleanor and the prince placed their buckets besides hers.